Welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm Phil Arno. Kim is on assignment today. And joining me is John DeShulo because he has a very special connection with our guest today. I certainly do. And Phil, you know, joining us for the show today is Buffalo broadcast legend Phil Buth. Now, you and I both got our starts at Channel 7. You were a little earlier than I. Uh, and it was under Phil's reign that, uh, as general manager that the number one status that started when you started in 1972 continued. Phil was in charge there from 1976 until officially 1987. He moved on to become the ABC president in charge of Good, Good Morning America and some late night projects we'll talk about. And uh, when I was at Channel 7, I put together some video for Phil's final appearance on AM Buffalo, which includes a memorable visit from the late comedian Soupy Sales. Let's take a oh, look. Oh, boy. I had dinner with him last night, uh, and uh, it was a great place. It is a new Chinese Mexican restaurant <laughs> in town called Chow Jose's. <laughs> Chow Jose's. Well, there's only one problem. An hour after you eat, you want to do body and fender work. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife, Betty, is beautiful. And I heard Phil, was a very romantic guy, he whispered to Betty, he says, I love you terribly. And she says, I know you do. <laughs> but he's, he's going to try to improve it. So. <laughs> I love him. He's great. Move closer to your world, my friend. Take a little bit of time. Move closer to your world, my friend, and you'll see. Just a little bit of time That's all it takes to bring your world together Take a little bit of time Don't turn away, my friend, tomorrow's are forever Get close to the people Your world needs you Care to share it, take the time to your world. That's the, those are the lyrics to the Eyewitness News theme, and this is Phil Buth Thank you, us. thank you. I'm uh, thrilled. This talk of the town, this should be the talk of the town. I'm thrilled for you people at this new station. I'm, it's, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful what you're doing here, and I love some of those local shows you're doing, too. Thanks, thanks, Phil. You've caught me. You know, you caught me. Well, I'm you know, and, and you have a new book out talking about your legacy uh, in, in the broadcasting. It's called Limping on Water. And uh, let, let's, before we get into anything, talk about the title of the book and, and how it kind of relates to where we are today. Well, you see, I have this little cart that I, I get around on. I have had cerebral palsy all my life. And for a long period now, I haven't been able to finally caught up to me and I haven't been able to walk. So I walked for a limp, with a limp for a long time, and when we took over the ABC television network in 85, I met some old friends because we were always an ABC affiliate, and one day the chairman was telling the new friends what it was going to be like, and they were asking questions like, who's going to do Good Morning America? How do you know what you bought? Uh, who's going to control your costs? And, uh, and, and Tom Murphy, our chairman, uh, in front of 250 people, kept saying, well, Phil will do that, or Phil will do this. And, and uh, I was very flattered, but I was getting a lot of attaboys. And that night, the managers of the stations we were inheriting, or buying, were together having a drink. And one of them from LA, who's sort of a mischievous guy anyway, said, uh, you know, if you listen to Tom Murphy, the chairman, you think Philly Buth limped on water. <laughs> well, we didn't have cell phones or Twitter or anything like that, but if we had, it would have been gone around even faster. But it went through our company pretty, pretty quickly. So I decided after 10 years of thinking about writing this book, I did write it. And so I used that as a title, and people seem to love it. It's different. Do, do you think by having those challenges, Phil, that that gave you more ambition and more drive well, certainly you know, earlier in life and maybe even well, you're not the first person who ever asked me that but I never thought very much of it I was I was very very conscious of it while I was a kid in the schoolyard because I couldn't run and stuff and uh, but once I got into college and then 
managed to move along pretty well. I didn't think about it, I just had this limp. And there were some people, since it wasn't so severe, there were some people I worked with who never even realized it. They'd say, hey, Phil, did you trip or something? You hurt your leg or something? And I'd say, I've always been like that. I'd say, I never noticed it. But later, as I got, as I got older and, and weaker, which happens, uh, I'm, I'm 84 now, and <laughs> I feel like I'm 60, but that's all right. As, and then, then I have to, I, I couldn't walk and I lost my balance about yeah. 10 years ago. But this is, these little carts are so good I can get around. Oh, you do, you, do, you do pretty good. Now, all Phil, you're, you're from Western New York, from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. I'm from Philadelphia. Phil, where are you from? Well, I was born on Staten Island, New York, and uh, left to go to college at Union College in Schenectady. And uh, then was hired by WRGB as a page in college, WRGB Schenectady, NBC affiliate. And I spent the longest time there as a page than any other page in their history, they tell me. And uh, I really got to learn the business. And then they sent me to graduate school as the first GE executive trainee in broadcasting ever. And I went to graduate school, got a graduate degree from Syracuse and went back in 1955 to see my benefactors at WRGB and Bob Hanna, the, the, the general manager, said, I'm embarrassed, GE has just put a freeze on, I can't hire you. Well, what happened was, I went looking for a job, and Hanna called a fellow named Tom Murphy who was gonna start a new station in Albany as a competitor, and he asked him to come play golf. And they were playing golf, and Hanna said to Murphy, who do you have? And then Murphy said, I gotta start from scratch, he said, I'm going to lend you a person. I'm going to lend you Phil Butte. And to, to, so Tom hired me without ever meeting me. And you were the first employee. I was the first employee. The capital Cities for Albany, the capital of... Capital uh, Cities, which became one of the premier broadcast companies in the world. And speaking of Capital Cities, they were the owners of WKBW, and you got your start, Phil, when at WKBW? Uh, well, actually, I started at the radio station, WKBW, in 1969 when I was still in college. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then when I graduated, I moved over to the TV side. We were still on Main Street, and yeah. this was before your time sure. <laughs> there. And that was quite an experience. Uh, Irv was the news director yes, at I the know. time. I've and, heard uh, many times, he's told me. Yeah, we, we still <laughs> uh, shot is, a, a, a film there, and I was well, well, in the film lab uh, on weekends. And in 1960, Tom Murphy, the chairman, said to me, I was then in promotion, I suppose, he said, I'm going to take a ride, let's take a ride to Buffalo from Albany. I said, okay, so we're going to go, and we're going to leave early in the morning, we're going to come back the same night. So we left early in his Thunderbird, and we drove here to Buffalo, and we watched a little television, but we went up to Toronto. And then on the way to Toronto, I saw all these antennas pointed toward Buffalo. Tom says, that's why we're coming here. See all those antennas toward Buffalo? We're gonna add that to the Buffalo marketplace. We're gonna buy it. So we bought it from Doc Churchill. We bought the radio and television, and that was in 1960 uh, or 61. And uh, I didn't come back here until 80, Five or so, 76. 76, yeah. 76. Because you, you're, go ahead. A lot of people don't realize that back in the day, Buffalo was the big city, and Toronto was actually, they yeah. paid a lot of attention to Buffalo. A lot of people came from Toronto to have a good time in Buffalo. Oh, they sure did, sure did. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting when you look at the ratings, and I had an opportunity to read one of the rating books, the Toronto and Canadian audience for WKBW and the other American stations, two and four as well, far exceeded what Canadian stations oh, were, sure. were getting. And that was, that was the problem that they had. They passed a rule saying that if you were a Canadian advertiser and you advertise in Buffalo, you couldn't declare it, declare it as an income expense, a business expense. So we had to worry about that. And we knew we were gonna lose. But what we do is we knew we had to delay because we were writing business every day. So we hired Turner, the promo, former prime minister, to be our attorney. And he managed to delay things for a long time. And uh, we did reasonably well from Toronto. So from Albany, your, your career took you with Capital Cities to Fresno, uh, well, West Virginia? Well, Albany, as we began, began to buy new stations, I went to West Virginia for a while. That was my purgatory, I think, and as, as I write about in the book. 
It was, the, it was in West Virginia of the 60s, which was absolutely their worst time in the history of that state. And um, then uh, they moved me to Fresno, California to take over a station that was really in trouble. And we did reasonably well there. And then they sent me to Buffalo, which I loved. I absolutely loved it here. And I've loved the city ever since. And we had, uh, we set some records. We set some records. <laughs> right, right now, I don't know what the ratings are. But at the time, for a long time, for eight, nine years, Irv, Rick, and Tom on the news had 45, 50% of the audience every single time they were on the air. Right. It was a rating, not a share. Yeah. So you literally had half of the audience. I know we're going to go a little bit, by the way, we're going to go a little bit longer with, with this opening segment. I know that Chatham in the control room is listening. But no, Phil, I mean, we would have, you know, just Phil mentioned, half of the audience on yeah. any given day. It was unprecedented. And then, as we were either the one, two, or three station in America in terms of, of that large an audience. We're going to have to get in, in the next segment, we're going to have to get into the Irv, Rick, and Tom phenomena. Well, it, was um, one, it was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? In the next segment, we'll get into that, and we're going to get into how this Buffalo story uh, turns into a national story and quite a phenomena. And we'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Talk of the Town as we continue our conversation with Phil Buth. When I started at uh, WKBW, uh, Irv, Rick, and Tom were the phenomena in town. Sure, Everybody, sure. you know, watched, uh, you know, with great anticipation our newscast. And I got to tell you, Irv was not the typical newsman. I mean, he really broke the mold when it came to on-air personalities. Would, would a guy like Irv, would that trio have done as well in any other market? Well, I don't know, Phil, uh, but uh, they certainly did well here. Um, they, they, uh, they, they were a phenomenon. They, they just all worked so well together. And I still talk to them all. And uh, Irv is in uh, California and Rick is in North Carolina. And Tom lives near me in Florida. And, uh, but we thought about moving them because we owned other stations, and we owned Philadelphia, for example, and Philadelphia was very news-oriented, and Irv always thought, well, oh, I ought to be in Philadelphia. But we realized that Irv was Buffalo. So we kept telling him how great he was, he was in Buffalo, and that it, we, he was too, too valuable to himself. He, was, he would be happier here. And then there were some studies taken and things which will remain confidential. But, but I, I, don't think, I don't think he would have been as happy. We had a commercial, a promotion ad, that with three guys walk into a bar, and this ran in the air, and they say, hey, we're new, we're just visiting. What's Buffalo like? And the bartender turns and he pushes a button, and up comes Irv, and he says, that's Buffalo. <laughs> Those, and, those spots were produced by the great Mike oh, Davis. Oh, yes, Mike Davis, absolutely. And, and you did some other spots with another oh, friend oh. named Ted Knight. Now, you know, oh, Ted Knight, who was on the Mary Tyler Moore Show, mm -hmm. was also an employee going back to your Albany days. Yep, I hired Ted uh, in 1957 for $15,000 a year, which was pretty good then. He was a, a ventriloquist and a, puppet, a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. And he was really a very talented fellow. And we built a whole station around him competing with WRGB in Albany. And, and what happened was that Ted got so good, he kept saying to me, Phil, I have to make more than that. I have to make more money. I, I got two kids, I can't, I can't survive. And I said, well, go up the stairs and talk to Tom Murphy. He's a fair guy. And he'd like to hear what you have to say. Well, I remember sitting on a pedestal in the studio, talking with others and make, doing some programming, and Ted was gone for a half an hour. He came back with a big smile on his face. He says, that was the best thing you ever told me to do, Phil. I am so happy. I said, did you get a raise? He said, no. I said, well, why are you happy? He says, he told me I was too good for Albany, and if, I gave, if he gave me a $50 raise to keep me here, it would be the worst thing ever happened to me. So I'm going to Hollywood. Two weeks later, we had a party at his home, a little place he rented on a lake. And uh, his, the, in, the, in the 
driveway was a station wagon with the top covered with all kinds of stuff and loaded with all of his earthly possessions and he drove off and we kept we kept in touch with him and when he got the job with Mary Tyler Moore, I said, sent him a telegram. I said, never in the history of broadcasting has anyone ever been so perfectly cast because <laughs> Ted Baxter was Ted Knight. I used to write for him, lay awake nights, two in the morning and three in the morning for the, the show we did together for six, seven years. And he'd, I'd bring the script in and Beverly would type it and He'd stand in the doorway going, oh, 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 and he'd, he'd weigh it. And he'd say, you know, you're two minutes over <laughs> by weighing it. And then he'd say, you mean a man of my talents has to read garbage like this? <laughs> and we'd all say, read it, Ted, read it. <laughs> okay, okay. And he, now, what was funny is that after the Mary Tyler Moore show, Oh, yeah. You worked with him. They did news promos for Talk anchors in other cities. Oh, we did a lot of things. I was his partner, business partner, on the side until he died in '86. Uh, I remember, and uh, we didn't make very much money, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it's always we had a lot of fun. He what was, is it about the business that I you have a lot of fun? I mean, we we oh. like to see that we do that here at WBBZ and. Yeah. Well, we built a company ba based upon integrity, service to the community, and being serious about our license. And I know you guys are serious about that. When you get a license to, to broadcast, you have an obligation to do your very best. I used to call it Sinatra in One. I want the, our, our station to look like Sinatra in One because when he's on the stage, nobody takes their eyes off him. And I always wanted every station I ever had, I want to be Sinatra in One. And that's what we try to do, and do it right. No shortcuts, no second chances if you, if you do anything dishonest or disreputable. But this company hired fewer people, paid them better than anybody else, gave them stock in the company, which as you know, went crazy. I mean, really crazy, and, uh, and, and leave, left them alone. We hired the best people we could and left them alone, but always integrity was our word. Warren Buffett said we were the, run, the best company running the business. Absolutely, we had two great leaders, Tom Murphy and Dan Burke, and they were remarkable, but they left us alone. Well, and part of that journey was to, like you know, we're doing here with, you know, and certainly, you know, local programming and the connection to the community. I, I've always so felt important. was, was Absolutely key. The, the Variety Club used to help us so because their members were our fan club. And we, we, we gave it back in return to them because we'd worked very hard with them. And it was wonderful for years. Uh, and uh, it, it just paid off nicely. Well, and not only Variety Club, but so many other not for profit organizations, including Absolutely. Cerebral Palsy Association yep, and, and others. Yep, yep. If, if you were to give a band like Phil Arno advice, I mean, here you are you know, a veteran of Capital Cities and ABC, and we'll get into ABC in a minute, but what, what advice would you give Phil well, as a local owner? Well, I can't presume to, this man is a, is a, is a legend in his time too. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He's, he's, he's a, a crapshooter, and we were crapshooters. We had this chance to do it, and he's doing the same thing. I would just say, keep it up, only, uh, I, as I said at the end of the book, I'll do it all over again. If I do it a little better, be fine. But I didn't have to do it better because you're doing fine. And I think that uh, as long as you, you have faith in people like John and others um, and, and keep providing programs that would attract eyeballs, you you I know you you are doing fine. I think it's terrific. I, I, well, think, it's, it's, I, I it's bought a, a place, I, I bought a condo here in Buffalo for the summers. Mm -hmm. And I've been watching that you often. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew Raymond Burr. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said there he is, Ironsides. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, we have good programs with MeTV, and we, we try and sprinkle in as many uh, local programs as we can because we want to connect with Western New York. Great. And that's, that's the combination. We want to have a niche that, that's different from all the other stations in town and reaches Western New York like none of the other of stations can. Well, when we went to, well, we had these philosophies in our company. And when we went to ABC and took over, we were the minnow that swallowed the whale. Everybody thought ABC was buying us. <laughs> we bought them and we practiced the same, the same values and culture at ABC, even though 
the cultures were, were quite different. It was quite different to, to go and take over a big network where, from a bunch of local stations. But our principles and our, our philosophies and our work ethic worked on ABC because we took it to number one in, within two years. And in five years, we had paid back the whole price of the network, and we bought it for three and a half billion and sold it for 19 billion. That's with a B. And it was just doing the things we had done all along in stations and newspapers all over the country. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when, when uh, you know, these little local guys come into ABC and, and say, hey, we want to buy you. I want the, the ABC executives must have said, what? Where did Le these guys come from? <laughs> no, Leonard Goldenson, the chairman, asked us to buy them. Hmm. He said, I don't have a succession plan here, and you're the best affiliate we have, hmm. and so why not? And Murphy was there the previous week saying, Leonard, you might throw me out of this window, but I'd like to buy ABC. Hmm. And then, of course, Warren Buffett heard about it. Warren Buffett has been our advisor since the early 70s, and quite a man. I've been thrilled to be with him so many times. And uh, he said, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll put up $585 million. You got any money? Well, we, he knew we had $2 million. We borrowed a million from a bank, and we had another million and a half. So we put up two and a half, three and a half billion dollars. And we bought the network, it's, and off we went. Off we went. It, we, well, but you, were, uh, you are right, Phil. I mean, it was an amazing journey and 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 i think maybe what, what you're speaking to because you know phil was in los angeles for so many years i think the sensibility of people certainly in los angeles and new york to see you know like when you came in from buffalo to run good morning america oh, yeah i, I oh, do boy. i now that i have to believe speaking to phil's earlier oh, question boy. i'm sure that eyebrows oh, the, were raised the new york press the, 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 from where? <laughs> Who's gonna, what's, what are you gonna do with David Hartman? Well, David and I got along very well. I relieved him of his job and hired Charlie Gibson and Spencer Christian, kept Joan London because she was very solid. And so was David in a different way, but David is still very, very comfortable with our, the arrangement we made for him. But Charlie Gibson took over and pretty soon we were number one and for a long time we were number, we took the, cut, the show all over the world, but they, we had to we had to get accustomed to things. They they were spending twelve thousand dollars a week on local flowers for Good Morning America, but I didn't realize when I moved into an apartment that I rented when I moved to New York temporarily why I got a big vase of flowers every Sunday in front of my <laughs> my door until I canceled the contract, and all of a sudden they disappeared. <laughs> but uh, it was $600,000 a year Gosh. on his life. What, what, uh, and Phil, what Phil Buth and Phil, or Phil Arner could do was $600,000. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I, got, I got into a, 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 a Murphy assigned Warren and I to go and look at the other properties we bought. And when I got, I'll never forget, I opened the door to the limo, and he's sitting in there, and he said, hey, did you hear about the flowers on Good Morning? I said, yeah. 600,000, he says, I'll do it for 50. I said, Warren, I'm going to do it for 35. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, that was the case with a lot of, a lot of the, the takeover. Now, as you're sitting... But it was very positive. Uh, yeah. Watching TV today, what's your opinion of the way broadcasting has moved along and, and evolved since you've been into it? Well, I, I, I hesitate to... to um, criticized because I'm not there in the arena right now. When I was operating in Buffalo, there were only eight or nine signals. Now there's 200 or 300 to choose from. But I think that it's going to get narrower and narrower and more and more specific in terms of taste. You know, it used to be if you wanted to watch tennis, there wasn't much tennis. And then all of a sudden there's a lot of tennis. The whole, whole channel. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and just like just like everything else, the, the more popular you get, and um, so, uh, sometimes it's the lowest common denominator in taste, which I don't like, uh, I would never put The Simpsons on the air if I had my chairs. We would never have cleared a show like Simpson because right. it taught everything except discipline. And it taught revolt from reality and authority 
and I think it's the worst thing ever happened to television. Uh, but, but today, anything goes. I hear people using bad language on late night television. I think it's just a terrible example. Our company would never put up with that. Well, uh, and I think maybe that's something too, that you know, in addition to the technology, that's certainly something to speak to. Well, you know, I think uh, the programming has devolved a little bit to the fact that, you know, you see a lot of bathroom humor, you know, they're not as creative. Even the dramatic shows have followed a pattern where everybody copies everybody else. Oh, sure, There's no sure. originality. Um, Me too. Is you know, I spent 20 years out in Hollywood and, and the mentality slowly changed from original, original thinking and originality to what works, oh, that guy did this. Let's see if we can do, do a variation thing. of the same thing. Yeah. And that's the decision making has basically become taken the, the simplest form. What will work that's the cheapest and, and the least uh, path of resistance. And, and when you do that, you come up no, with you know, the lesser programming. And my philosophy, and tell me if you agree with this, if you put, I don't care how many programs are on, how many channels are on, if you come up with a good program, whether you promote it or don't promote it, people will find it. Build it and they will come. It will, it will get an audience. If it's good programming, yes, yes. people will find it. I know. I know. And it'll be successful. Well, we've certainly tried here. And you talked about late night. And to explain a little bit of the triangle of when Johnny Carson's reign was coming to an end, because you were also in charge of late night for ABC. I was running along, and GMA was doing very well, and we, we hired a man from CBS to start a late night show. No stations wanted it. They didn't want to compete with Johnny Carson. KB doesn't, didn't want it, for example. They were running a movie and making a lot of money. Because you carry a network show, you get a couple hundred dollars a night. Even though Johnny Carson only paid the stations a couple hundred dollars, they had to have Johnny Carson. You didn't have to have Rick Dees, so all of a sudden we had a show. And immediately it wasn't very good. I had nothing to do with it. And then my boss said when it was dying, when the stations were leaving it, to, we got down to 32% of the country had it instead of what you need is 92%. He said, Phil, go out in Hollywood and rescue that show. I said, oh, come on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Only have 32% of the audience now of the stations. He says, go on out. Well, I went out, held Rick D's hand for, for two or three weeks, tried to get him to get us to hire Sinbad as a foil and give it more variety. And he would just, he wanted to do it all himself. And to this day, we're good pals, but he just, he just would not, give in to trying to run it himself. And, and so we took it off the air. And then I had, we had a whole bunch of other shows that were really fun to do. I, then I was in charge of late night. Well, you had but, a project with... Uh, oh, oh, we had Tony the, uh, Danza. Yeah, we had, Tony Danza. Oh, we had, we had all kinds of people. And, and then the uh, and Lifestyles it, of the Rich and Famous. Uh, oh, Brick, uh, yeah, we did that show with um, Robin Leach. Robin Leach, yeah. And then the one we had the most fun was with uh, Ga ba Brad Garrett, uh, the fellow from Everybody Loves Raymond. Everybody yeah. Loves Raymond. Yeah. He was the best, and he could have made it, but he had other ideas. Did did David Letterman almost come over to ABC? What do you mean? Was wasn't there a negotiation with David Letterman to perhaps bring him over to ABC at one point before CB before his deal with CBS? Um, not really. I met with him once quickly. And uh, he wanted to go at 11.30, even with Jay, with Jay Leno. And we would not give up Ted Koppel. That was our style. We were committed to a man like Ted Koppel, we're gonna stay with him. Letterman came along, no, that's the way it is. We tried to convince David that at midnight, with the power of our stations, we'd be good enough to go against Leno, and he wouldn't have any of it. And he was very cordial about it. But um, he, uh, he's a very different kind of man. I bet. I liked him a lot. But you've met a lot of celebrities over the years. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sinatra was uh, the most fun. He called me boss. <laughs> okay, boss. <laughs> Whatever you think, boss. Well, we all called Phil boss. You know? <laughs> uh, Phil, you, you, you started a lot of careers. You really, Well, you know, Wolfgang Puck and Charlie Gibson and... Chantal in Chantal, Los Angeles. Chantal, yeah, yeah, I remember her. 
wonderful. There's a whole good piece in the book yeah, about Chantal. It, yeah. And the book is Limping on Water, and by the way, it's available at Amazon.com. So if you're interested, not just in broadcasting, but in the life story of, of Phil Buth. And good business. You know, it's, a, it's a nice bit. Warren yeah. wants me to take out a little bit or expand a little bit on the personal stuff and make it more of a business primer. And I said, you know, I'm... I'm I don't have, I'm not really. I don't interested. know how you can, you, you mentioned. And all the charity, all the, all of the proceeds go to charity, and uh, uh, that's the way it should be. I don't need to make any money on it. But I, I am proud of the book because a lot of people have, we've sold 1,500 copies already, and uh, Warren Buffett has uh, helped me. He, he sent out notice to uh, many of his friends saying, buy this book and give it to your department heads, and I got orders from uh, all kinds of leaders of our, of our business, send me six, send me eight, send me 10. And it's, uh, I, I'm, the, response, the response is really remar remarkable. Well, you did talk about, you mentioned the personal side, and, you know, and I've known oh, you yeah. for, for a long time. And it, it's funny, Phil, you know, when you work for somebody, you think you know them and then you don't really know them. And I think in reading the book, we found out a lot. But l let me ask well, you about- my childhood was a, very, was a real hardship. Uh, um, I lost my father at, at four years old, and my mother was a remarkable woman who yeah. raised us. And we didn't have very money, any money at all, but we managed. And she was, she was just great. And, and then I got lucky and met a lot of good people. Well, and your wife, <laughs> Mary, your first wife, Mary, Betty. Uh, Betty. I'm sorry, a second wife is Mary. Your first wife, Betty, and then your family, Jane, and and uh, Robert and and Barry. And let's talk about maybe that because I you lost my son Barry, as as you know. Yeah. He, he was gay, and uh, we knew it from the time he was five years old. And he was the smartest of my children, spoke six languages, graduated at the top of his class at Berkeley, was named uh, the uh, uh, spokesman for his class at graduation, didn't show up. <laughs> and uh, he was, we went and found him a little stoned at his, uh, at his, grad, at his or at his dormitory room, and uh, he died unfortunately, and at 34 years old, and that was a tough loss. But it's it's, it's documented in the book, and and that led me to a career uh, offshoot, working for AIDS, and fortunately, our company agreed, and we produced the first meaningful AIDS programs ever on network television, and. Uh, uh, I asked uh, my boss, Tom Murphy, and he said, yes, go and spend anything you want to spend. And if you get any income, give it all to AIDS. And we ended up doing five three-hour specials, uh, which broke all records at the CDC in Atlanta for responses, and I'm told saved millions of lives, or hundreds of lives, or a number of lives. And that was, that's, that's rather poignant section of the book. Well, you turned a, a tragedy into certainly a triumph for a lot of families. I hope and, so. And, and, I, and hope I remember so. that show. And yeah. You're right, it was groundbreaking at a time when, you know, no one wanted to, to no touch one the would, subject. Uh, no one would mention the word. Yeah. And uh, there's a good chapter on it, uh, a very good chapter on it, uh, written by others. I had other people, and Tom Murphy called me and he said, you know, you did an unusual thing here. You had a lot of employees send in uh, their opinion of what the company was like. And I said, yeah, we did a whole chapter like that. We, I just pulled 11 or 12 people and said, send me what you thought and I'll print it just the way it is and, and it's in the book. And he said, well, I read the book quickly and didn't realize that. So I just ordered another 10 copies because I'm gonna send it, gonna have my kids send it to their kids and, 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 and read it because it's an inspirational. And that for anybody who knows someone who wants to start a business or a student of journalism, we have a lot of books sold to young journalism students. Well, it's a history. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a, and you mentioned everybody. I don't know how you remembered everybody, but you uh, had, I think uh, you I, mentioned I miss, everybody. I'm I, even the book. I mean, come yeah. on. You know? <laughs> I missed a couple, but the, I put them in the second edition. <laughs> there you go. All right. And it's interesting. Warren made me buy the second edition. He called me, and he said, he didn't call me. His, his secretary called me and said, 
Warren thinks you should order another 500 and he'll sell them at his convention. Well, he did. He sold 68 for me, mm. but I still have the rest of them to sell. <laughs> so I have 500 left to go <laughs> to sell, but we'll sell them. Well, the book is Limping on Water with Phil Buth. We'll be right back with more. We'll wrap this up right after this. Welcome back to Talk of the Town and our very interesting conversation with Phil Buth. And uh, Phil, you have an interest in uh, the Buffalo Broadcasters Association and they're trying to put together a museum. Yes. Where, where, where does that stand at this point? Well, we're, we're supposed to learn about it pretty soon because they have some artist renderings about what the interiors would look like and they have made some progress in finding a place. And uh, you're asking me something that I will learn more about this week and uh, John will certainly know about it, but uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting project uh, to, uh, to combine the, the arts in, the, in Buffalo, and there's a lot of history here, not only in broadcasting, but in music and... Well, yeah, things. as we were talking off, you know, in between, uh, during the break, sure. I, I think uh, a museum in Western New York that represents the history of all of Western New York. Yep. Well, and part of it would be sports, part of it would be music, part of it would be the broadcast. And the museum. history of the Erie Canal. I'll and tell you and <laughs> there is important. such a rich history to this area. Yeah. I mean, not just the local history, but as it fits into the country, because this was such an important part of the country for so much of the country's history. I mean, the Erie Canal, as you say, so and, and the, the trip you know, from New York west had to go through Buffalo. Yep. Um, I think a, a broad museum that encompassed a lot of the history of the area would be a good way to get the broadcast museum you know, accomplished. Well, well, sometimes you I'll just bring that up with them. I will, I promise you that. If there's anybody that can get together. something done, it's, it's well, you. I'm not sure of that anymore. It's been a long time, you know. <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody who isn't, who is under 40 doesn't know what we're talking about. <laughs> well, you know that. Yeah. I left here 30 years, 35 years ago. It seems so. like only yesterday. But the smart yeah. ones still know how to pay attention. And, okay, you know, I to, hope so. To the, to the wisdom <laughs> that comes I, along with age well, and experience. I hope so. <laughs> well, and I, and, and I mentioned, you, well, your first wife is Betty, your, your, your second wife is, is Mary. Betty had passed. Betty, Mary's with you now. And, and you live in Florida. Yeah. And I live in Naples, Bonita Springs, really. And you also have a condo here. Yeah. So you continue to make Buffalo your home. What oh, is it about I Buffalo? It. I remember when oh, you went people. to I remember when you went to New York, you'd come back for a visit and we'd have you Boys, on. Sure. And you would <laughs> harp on the fact that brand muffins were like <laughs> three for a dollar here. Here three, at Wegmans. Three fifty a piece in New York. Yeah, all right. And <laughs> no, you, you no. lamented that. I once sent my boss, it's in the book. I once sent my boss Dan a little note. We never talked about compensation. And I was always paid very well. And I moved to New York not even knowing what I was going to earn. And after a while, after six weeks or so, he said, how you doing? I said, I don't know. I'll write you a note about it. So I wrote him a little funny note that I thought was funny. I said, you know, I'm, on, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to watch my cholesterol, et cetera. And today, brand muffins are supposed to be good for you. In Buffalo, they were three for a dollar. And here, they're three fifty a piece. <laughs> I said, I don't know. How did that happen? <laughs> and he sent me a, 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 a note with a stamp on it. And I won't tell you what it said <laughs> on the stamp, but it started with bull, <laughs> and accompanied by a six-figure check. Mm. Wow, but well, that's a lot of muffins. That's good. <laughs> well, so, you're, so you have your place here. What, what is next for you and Mary? Well, we travel a lot. I also, we also have a home in the Caribbean. We've had a, a business in the Caribbean for, oh, 25 years, uh, a beautiful resort in St. Martin that we built. And uh, we go down there three times a year, and that's fun. St. Martin's a beautiful place, right on the water. And I'm very lucky that way. Maybe we'll bring bragging rights there. So there you go. The game show. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, for the whole, I, the I, whole I, gang. I might not have enough room, but I could make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make it for you. Uh, and uh, so we are very busy. We're very yeah. busy. And Mary has, uh, you know, you, uh, the name was Mary Grace. And, in, in Buffalo at Chemical Bank, and, and uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful life. We're very fortunate, and we travel a lot, and I get around with this thing. And the matter, took, we took a 20-day safari in Africa on this thing. Wow. So you see, you can do anything. 
I hear you. That's something else that says in the book, you know, Can you work hard and you work hard and, you, and, you, and you're smart enough and you're lucky enough, you can do anything. Well, thanks to you, I've been able to succeed here in Buffalo and I appreciate oh, well. the break you gave me. <laughs> he was book. one of the best persons I ever hired. Oh, well, I don't know about that. I, <laughs> oh, it's true. You know, it's a long story, but it's, it's and the, but thank you. <laughs> Let me just publicly say thank you. And that was in 1982. Where are we going to sell that next? We're going to sell this at Talking Leaves Books. We're going to create an event with on Main Bill. Street. Main Street, 11 uh, at 38. I mean, it's on the Wednesday, August 24th. Talking Leaves, 3158 Main. And we're going, uh, to make, we're going to do a little question and answer. We do a Q and A. Uh, it's going to be free. It's going to it, th that hour will fly by because well, even it's going in to be our more January, than an hour. Come well, on. Well, maybe we'll make it two. You know. Come on. Maybe we'll make it three. <laughs> Good. We're going to be there seven till question mark. Seven till question mark. And yeah, if you yeah. want to get there early, I'll be there early. Good point. Good point. I will be there very early, 5:30. And the money is going to go to, to With not a for pen. profits. I will be signing the books. Phil, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's so much fun being here. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Good luck. Well, Good luck. we can use it. And thanks a lot for being here, Phil Buth, one Keep of the moving. legends of Western Keep New York moving. broadcasting. Don't let anybody catch you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching WBBZ. Thanks a lot for watching Talk of the Town.